Welcome everyone to this week's edition of Military Trailblazer Office Hours. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your Wednesday evening to spend it here in the spirit of community, mentorship, and learning. I'm your host, Dave Nava. I'm a lead solution engineer at Salesforce and a military trailblazer. Each week, as you're probably aware, we invite a co-host or sometimes co-hosts to take part in the conversation so we can leverage their experience, their expertise, and their unique perspectives. The focus for tonight's session is pivots and synergies, how to transition between careers. And so I'd like to take a, a moment and welcome and briefly introduce our co-host for tonight's session. Amanda is the VP of Global Customer Experience and Solutions at BioNanogenomics, and it's a biotech firm that, that focuses on genome biology. Uh, she's a transformation expert with over 20 years of experience in global business, digital transformation, customer experience, and operations management. It is awesome to have you here, Amanda. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I think you must have scraped that from my uh, LinkedIn profile because I know I, I, I didn't share that with uh, with David. So I think I'm doing OK if you got it from there. <laughs> Guilty. Yep, I, I certainly did. Okay. <laughs> so Good. do you want to take a moment and um, kind of introduce yourself further and share your background a bit? Sure thing. Um, first thing first, my last name is spelt with two T's and two N's in case you're looking for me online. Uh, you won't find me under one end. So uh, there you go. Um, that's the first piece. Um, I would say, so who's Amanda? You know, I am a million and one things. I would say I'm a trailblazer. I'm an innovator. I'm a transformer, a technologist, a leader, a veteran, a social anthropologist. And sometimes I rhyme in my spare time. Um, I have spent uh, about 25 years in business uh, and digital transformation and then customer experience. And most of the time when I say that, I get people's, uh, you know, one eyebrow goes up, like, what, is, what the heck is that, Amanda? And so I think what that means is, you know, um, to make it more relatable is I've led in groups such as business architecture, systems engineering, customer experience, AI, machine learning, robotics, um, consulting for solutions, digital transformation for growth of companies. I've also led in consulting divisions. I've been a corporate employee. I've been an entrepreneur and led several um, venture-backed startups. Uh, somewhere along the way, I became a um, venture-backed startup, an angel investor, um, where I owned my own consultancy. I became a radio show host. I've been in high tech, insure tech, financial tech, and biotech uh, for the past 20 plus years. So um, that's a bit about me. Hopefully you can hear a little bit of pivots in there uh, because you don't start off in the Air Force uh, in aerospace medicine and end up in a, you know um, biotech um, by accident, right? Um, even though I did. So I hope to share with you a little bit more about um, what that is, some pivots, some synergies, some um, you know, some failures maybe, uh, and some, you know, um, uh, just kind of that squirrely path you take internal and external. That's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. And, and I'm sure it mirrors the professional journeys of a lot of folks on the call, both military and military spouses who are used to kind of pivoting and transitioning every few years to something new. So, um, you know, if, if you weren't uh, convinced before, I think you are now that Amanda's well qualified to talk to us about career transition. Um, what we'll do here uh, before we open the floor for discussion is I'll go ahead and, and share some administrative items like I, I usually do for folks that may be new uh, to the call. Um, so what these office hours are is they're informal get together for gathering with military trailblazers and allies to explore non-technical Salesforce career and branding related topics to help you achieve your professional development and career related goals. So for the next hour, it is your opportunity uh, to access collaborative mentorship where everyone on the call is encouraged to step up and help answer questions or ask questions from your perspective, which of course provides additional diversity of experience to the answers given. Um, so as always, please keep an eye on the chat window during tonight's session. Um, I have already started posting things and I'll be posting things throughout the session. Just uh, little tidbits that I pull from LinkedIn and from Twitter throughout the week, employment opportunities, volunteering opportunities, um, knowledge sessions from some of the other trailblazers in the ecosystem. So these are your sessions. Um, I am just a guest here. Um, it's really up, up to you to ask the you know the questions that you are interested in. So if you have a question at any point during today's session, feel free to ask it. Uh, if you don't want, feel comfortable speaking up, um, you can either raise your hand and I'll call on you or you can post it in chat and I'll go ahead and read it off for you and no problem doing that. And so with that, I'll go ahead and open the floor for questions uh, and ask the first one and then I will turn it back over to the group to see what questions you have. 
So uh, Amanda, can you talk about, um, and you, you mentioned them briefly, but can you talk in a bit more detail about some of the transitions you know, you've gone through in your career and specifically the lessons learned that you took from those career transitions? Yeah, there's so many. Um, and, you know, the wrinkles on my face will tell you tell you that, I think. Um, OK, so the very first transition, I go into the Air Force. I'm in aerospace medicine and I don't want to be in aerospace medicine and I want to get out of the service after my service commitment. And what do I do uh, now? What do I do with this amazing skills where I love the body? I love physiology. I love anatomy. I love nutrition. I love wellness. I love people. Uh, but now what? Um, so that's the biggest transition first time in, you know, that I had in my career, my life really, uh, into my professional career. What I did know that I loved was running the operations of the clinic. I liked starting the Air Force's first DNA program. I liked leading the finances. I liked the supply chain. I liked leading the teams and the programs. And so how do I take all those things that I love and make a transition into a totally new path, maybe, uh, or maybe it was going to be medicine. Um, but I think sometimes, uh, and maybe I'll get a little woo-woo during this conversation because I do believe in the power of, you know, positive thought and, you know, understanding your own vision and creating that for yourself. Um, when I kind of speak that out loud, um, suddenly a retired Air Force general shows up in my life immediately before I transition and said, I want you to come work for me in my business. And I said, yes. Uh, and I took the job. And what he offered me was a business operations role uh, to lead inside his technology and semiconductor practice. And so I said, yes. And then I promptly went home and probably Googled what the is a semiconductor. I had no idea. I was not exposed to technology. I did not know what that meant, what the implications of that were. And this is in um, 2000. <laughs> I got out of the Air Force in, in 2000. So um I went in, how does a nurse or, you know, medicine, you know, and, and technologist in, in the medical field go into semiconductors? Um, but the thing is, like, one of the lessons is just leap. Uh, sometimes you just have to believe in the skills that you have, um, you know, that are transferable. If I never made that leap, I wouldn't be where I am today, where I've led, you know, the entire last 21 years in high tech and digital tech, which I absolutely adore every single day. Um, so the leaping uh, and just going on faith uh, sometimes can be, you know, your biggest lesson learned. That said, I didn't I did not not believe um, if that's uh, appropriate to, uh, you know, that I didn't carry transferable skills with me. I think that's the other lesson here is that I was probably only 50 percent qualified for the job that I leapt into. But I carry a bag with me. I think about this in my um, career is that. Um, and it's not it's not a ladder, uh, you know, it's a trajectory and it's a portfolio you're building You're carrying this like bag of tools, if you will, everywhere that you go, soft skills and hard skills. So I didn't have some of the hard skills. I didn't I couldn't tell you what a semiconductor was or how to lead a technologist or how to lead a system or any of that. Um, but I, I knew that I was strong at leadership. I knew contracts. I knew how to do operations. I knew all the back office stuff, and I just believed that I would, you know, with learner's mind and curiosity, I would learn and develop in those other areas. Um, so that was sort of uh, the first pivot. Um, from there, I leapt into consulting because I just um, know that I'm a, a bit of a puzzle builder, and I also cannot sit still for more than like five minutes, um, and I have to be doing 55 things at the same time. Uh, and so Consulting was a great leap for me uh, because it meant I had ver a variety of clients, right? Uh, and what I leapt into at the time uh, in, um, gosh, 20 years ago was government consulting because it was more familiar to me given my military service. Uh, I led at clients like Peace Corps and Red Cross and Commodities Futures and you name it. I learned all sorts of different industry, if you will, but mostly in government. And from there, I learned operations, how to lead a PL, how to manage you know, a team across function, how to lead a client external and, and internal, um, certainly how to diffuse <laughs> conflicting situations, um, you know, a, a lot of um, stuff, if you will, great skill set went into my bag. 
Um, but I learned also that I didn't, my next transition was, I was kind of tired of um, dealing on a daily basis with the government. So now I want commercial consulting. I transitioned into commercial consulting and I had clients like Sony, Universal Music, Edwards Life Sciences, Caremark, CBS. It was, it opened up my whole world and I was like, wow, there's a whole industry out here that I just don't know anything about. Like, um, and so it gave me this exposure to clients and customers, industries, people, cultures globally that I never would have uh, had um, exposure to if I didn't do that. After um, that, my next transition was, wow, I don't want to do external consulting anymore. Now, what do I do? Um, I want internal clients. And, and, and so I made you know, my mind up that internal consultancy looked like transformation, operational excellence. I, you know, I'm focused on a particular um, silo within a business and then just expanding from there. So I joined Adobe Systems in Silicon Valley. And I led supply chain, operational excellence, M&A, media and digital tech. And to age myself, this was when Adobe had Box product and CD you still put into your <laughs> computer, right? So I was you know, one of the folks that helped Adobe go into the creative cloud um, and transition. And um, so the next pivot and transformation for me was if I was gonna lead mergers and acquisitions for Adobe, I needed to know all 12 of the groups that were engaged in a merger and acquisition, all the quote to cash in the background of a company and how does that work? How does legal work and how do we take revenue and how do we do this with the software and who does this with the HR and what about the employees you acquire? And, and, and so you can see all this knowledge just continually building and I learned that I love cross-function. I learned that I love leading a very large PL uh, in finances and a very large team. I think I had upwards 400 people at the time. Um, and uh, after I, I uh, um, left Adobe, I decided I was going to break out on my own again and start my own company. Um, I did that because I love data and I love software. And I started an insurance tech software company in Silicon Valley, gained venture funding, became an angel investor and on and on the transitions go. I mean, I could go on for the whole meeting about what I've done. Um, but, you know, uh, so there's a couple lessons in there that I hope you've heard. Um, one is uh, just say yes. Um, you don't need to know it all. You just need to leap sometimes and have faith um, that, you know, and trust in yourself and then trust in the people around you to catch you when you fall, because you will. Um, and, and another thing I like to tell people is that um, nothing is lost. Uh, when I transitioned from one industry to the next or one role to the next, I'm taking everything that I'm doing. I'm discarding the things that I don't like. Uh, so you're hearing some of these things. I, I liked government consulting until I didn't. And then I woke up and I was like, eh, I don't really like this. Let me try consult, you know, commercial. I get to take 50% of what I do, apply it to the next thing. And then there were some things I didn't care for there. So let me, you know, seek my next thing and drop away the things that I don't like and continue to carry the things that I do. So I like to say that really nothing is lost when you make a pivot or a transition or a jump to a new industry or a new role. You just add it. It's an additive, in my opinion, uh, and a throwaway of the things that you're like, never again will I do that, um, right? You get, you get that choice. Um, so you get to learn what you do like and you get to learn what you don't like. And sometimes the things that you don't like are, you know, of course, your biggest teachers. Probably a lot of the folks on the call identified with a couple of the themes that you mentioned, which are just leap. Uh, and you mentioned that, and then you don't have to be fully qualified. So I think a lot of people get hung up on the fact when they're reading job descriptions, oh, I, you know, I don't have that many certifications, or I don't have the two to three years of experience. But as, as, a, as you've shown, Amanda, you don't have to, I mean, have that level of experience. You don't have to meet every single requirement in the job description. When folks, when hiring managers and recruiters write these things, that's their, their you know, their best perfect person, which yeah. doesn't exist in reality. And, and so they will absolutely, you know, uh, take you on and, and, and give the opportunity to interview, even if you don't have all the requirements, if you can show that you're passionate, you're hungry, you're willing to learn. So that, that was awesome. Um, and I know like in my career too, I, I've, I've used the, the just leap or just say yes um, mentality. Um, Cause like you were mentioning earlier where you didn't necessarily even know when the, the general asked you to join his team, <laughs> what that role was, I got asked to be a solution engineer, which I am, that's what I do now. 
And uh, I said yes before I really knew what it was and had to go look it up. Uh, but then ended up interviewing for it, and it was it was and is a phenomenal role. So yeah, I would you know add to that that um, you know there is a gender bias that happens here too. You know, for uh, you know whoever identifies with whatever gender here, fifty percent of um, you know men, let's say um, you know apply when they have fifty percent of the qualifications of a job, and women. When they have 80 or 90 percent, that's when they apply. This is not good, guys. We need to change this paradigm. Um, when you have 50 percent, apply. Apply now. Usually when I'm writing job descriptions, I'm looking for a purple unicorn. And I have to you know, write the description as if there is this purple unicorn in the market. And 99 percent of the time, that person just doesn't even exist. So if you take that mindset and you look at a job description, you have to know that um, you're probably qualified for it. It's just, you know, first leap, apply and and also, you know, tell your story, um, have a very effective, you know, resume and, and story to tell. Yeah, those are great points. I'm really interested to hear, um, you know, what are some of the ways that you tell your story and how has it impacted your career? Um, in such a big way. I mean, I remember um, going to uh, after I, um, you know, moved into the first role, I remember moving into consulting and I remember one of the interviewers questions. So my undergraduate degree is in organizational dynamics. Uh, and <laughs> um, I remember the interviewing, you know, and I was applying to be a consultant leader, manager of a big team for consultancy in the government uh, for technology. And I think the manager that was interviewing me was like, what does your degree have anything to do with what you're applying for? And I was like, aha, it does. Um, what is organizational dynamics, but knowing who people are and what culture is and what it means to conflict manage and what it means to performance manage and what it means to have high performing teams who just give it all. Uh, and so like you have to be able to take whatever's thrown your way and, you know, take that into a story about your strengths and not necessarily your weaknesses, which is what people are really digging for when they're looking into your story. Right. Unfortunately, we're kind of biased and uh, lean toward the negative um, versus looking you know, for the things that actually matter. Um, so that's one. Uh, another thing I would say is um, I'm kind of old school when I use this term, but um, UPV. Uh, so, and I think it's been renamed somehow, but I call it unique position of value, UPV. And, um, and so this matters when it comes to your online presence, right? What is your unique position of value? So if you look at, you know, Amanda Lettman, what does she care about? Who is she? And does that immediately strike you when you look for my online presence or you hear me speak? The things that matter to me should become very apparent to you. Uh, you know, Amanda cares about uh, digital transformation and high tech. Um, she loves novel technologies and next gen technologies. And she like wakes up and eats that for breakfast. She likes women in tech and veterans in tech. Um, you know, she's a heart surgery survivor. So she supports all sorts of nonprofits that do amazing things with hearts. That's who I am. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, but I can't be all things to all people either. Uh, I can't do all of that and these 55,000 other things. So when you think about your unique position of value, uh, your story online, if you will, and the way that you speak about yourself, it has to be pretty succinct. Um, I would say choose three things that you really, really love and are passionate about and, you know, that define you and who you are or who you want to be and make sure those are just front and center. You know, in your profile, the way you speak to people, uh, your elevator pitch, if you, you know, I've refined this and helped people with this a lot. You know, what are those two sentences you say if all you have is that one minute to say who you are? Um, you know, be, be crystal clear. Um, and a lot of that is your own, going back to the woo-woo, uh, you got to get crystal clear on your own. What is that for you? Um, who do you want that to be? You know, who do you want to show up as? Um, so that, that's where I would start, David. That's a great point. And, and I hadn't heard that term before, unique position of value, but I'm going to file that one away. I, I always called it a brand. But but to your point, you know, it, it really comes down to practice. Like once you decide whatever your unique position of value is, what characteristics, personal, professional, that add value to, um, you know, to an employer uh, that you can position to get that job, you, you've got to practice it over and over and over again. So it becomes second nature. 
And, and I also wanted to point out something else you said, which I really appreciated. Um, so obviously, you know, as we come from our previous careers and, and we're transitioning, we're pivoting into a new career, you know, you have that one set of skills, right? But just because it may not be in the current industry, you can absolutely spin those skills and relate them to a wide variety of different positions and, and make them relatable and relevant. But again, that takes practice. You have to sit down and think about it. Okay, if I'm, you know, if I'm coming from, you know, maybe um, you know, education background and I want to be a system administrator, what what qualities, what characteristics that I, that I use in my position as a teacher that I can carry forward into, you know, being an administrator. And obviously the one that jumps out the most is, well, you're a teacher, you can teach people how to use the platform. So whatever your job was, to your point, you can spend those skills and relate it to the next job. So that's really powerful. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think when you think about transferable skills, it's not only hard skills, but soft skills and everything in between, right? Uh, so if I think about, you know, how to think about the teacher in the, you know, systems admin or the engineer, as an example, there's 55,000 things in there that is a transferable skill, not just teaching. What if you never want to teach another person in your life? Uh, you know, what if that's the thing you're discounting and saying, I don't want to do that anymore, but I want to do this. Um, you know, the ability to lead, uh, you know, um, very diverse cross-functional people. That's what teaching is, right? Uh, you're bringing all those people together, different personalities, different, uh, you know, cultures, uh, different ways that people learn. Um, you know, that is some serious soft skills uh, when you think about applying that to, to a job, to any job, in fact. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, one of the questions I had, um, and, and I, I do wanna hear from you guys on the, and gals on the call as well. So if you have questions, Feel free to raise your hand. I, I don't want to dominate the session. I want to hear what you have to say. Because uh, really, if you heard, you know, Amanda talking about it, if you want to be a Salesforce consultant, well, she was a consultant. So consulting, consultancy skills are universal. You're in front of the customer, regardless of what you're talking about, all of these skills apply. You know, she's, she's done jobs that, that you know, are, are program project management related. So, you know, whatever it is that you're interested in the ecosystem, there are relatable skills here that she can uh, talk to. So please do ask those questions if you have them. Um, and, and while you're thinking those up, I guess the question that I had was, you know, what what are some indicators that you use to help you decide when you're ready to transition to pivot? Ooh, um, gosh, let's see. Um, my mind goes to to growth. Um, so I think uh, one of the things I love to talk about is um, the fact that. Um, tag your it. You are the CEO of your own life. I don't care, you know, if you're unemployed, if you're employed, if you're an engineer, if you're a COO, it doesn't matter anything in between. I like to tell people that you're the CEO of your own life. And this this matters in your career, matters in your family and your business. It doesn't matter kind of what you're doing. So, um, you know, that's uh, um, an ideal, uh, you know, a philosophy that I've taken kind of every, everywhere that I'm going. And so if that's in fact true, because uh, I live like that, then my response to that would be uh, that it has to do a lot with growth. So if you um, are really the CEO of your own life and you've created a vision for yourself, for your career, for your life, where you want to go, uh, and you are giving your best effort on growth. You are going to classes, you are networking, you're getting a mentor, uh, you're applying yourself, you're going to group, name it, uh, all those things that are important. You're doing all of that. You're having conversations with your manager, you're meeting your skip levels, so you're kind of doing all of this. And there still appears to be no opportunity for growth. Um, you know, laterally or up, you know, or anywhere around, I would say that's probably an indicator um, that something is not quite right in the company that you're in. Uh, and, you know, it might lead to a transition. I would also tell you that um, while, while many veterans may not have a challenge with this or even have had experience with this, um, there is, uh, you know, a very small percentage of people in the corporate world that perhaps shouldn't have their jobs. Um, so the reason I say that is because ethics and character to me are like this up here. Uh, okay. And so a transition might be because you're working with a company or with people or, you know, for somebody or something entity that doesn't have the highest standards. Um, and this happens. Uh, it certainly has happened to me. 
Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, you get to make a choice. Uh, do I want to stay or do I want to go? Uh, and in many cases, uh, you know, depending for my choice, it's I have to go um, because I got to sleep on my own pillow at night. Um, and, you know, this is one of my top values. So I would say that's the other thing is when a company or an opportunity or a path doesn't meet your own value system, um, that's probably a transition for you somehow. Um, you know, in or out or around, uh, if you will. Um, but I would say if you are making a transition, you know, um, as always, it's key to leave with respect um, and to, you know, make, uh, you know, the situation as, as bearable as possible in, in those cases. Um, it's not personal many times. Sometimes you're leaving in a transition because there's a reduction in force. Um, there's a layoff. There's something like that. You can still keep your head high. It's okay. It's happened to me too. Um, it's, you know, look to your network uh, and, you know, just get going again. Um, right. So those are, those are the few things that come to mind, David. Hopefully that's helpful. You know, for folks that, that may be coming up on a career transition or, um, you know, contemplating one in the future, what are some ways that you can leave a company on your best foot and not burn that bridge um, while, while honoring, you know, the the commitment and, and, and the time they've taken to put into you to develop you, you and your professional skills yet, um, you know, obviously leaving and going to a, to a new company? Um, I guess the attitude that I take is nothing is forever. Um, this might be, again, this is just Amanda Lettman talking here, um, but I, I do believe we are not meant for things forever. Um, there's a season for everything, including roles, including jobs, including companies, sometimes including spouses. I mean, you, you, you name it, right? There's just a season for everything that you're doing. Uh, and so I try not to take that personally. So if you're building the right relationships you you know you have a, a relationship with your hr manager with your manager with your skip level manager with your network um you know giving the appropriate amount of time making sure you're messaging it correctly uh you know um uh, making sure you're you know just doing the right thing i mean i, I don't know how else to say it other than that um, you know, don't don't burn your bridges. Your network is your uh, deepest, you know, probably your deepest um, bet when it comes to finding finding your next thing. Um, uh, there's um, jobs that I've gotten reduction in force from and, or people that I've had to lay off or even fire that years later are giving me, uh, you know, reviews. So this is the aim is that, you know, you're, you're the people around you, uh, if you're willing to work with them again, should remain in your network um, in a, in a strong way. Um, but it's not personal when you, when you're making a departure, just, you know, tell the truth, give the time, be respectful, uh, and communicate. Yeah, those are great points. And, and I think, um, to expand on your point, I think the, the desired end state is for that company that you're leaving to, when you leave to say, Hey, you know, um, if you ever want to come back, you've got a place here. Uh, and so that, I think that's your indicator that you've done it well, you've done it right, you know, you've been humble, you've thanked them for their time. Um, one of the things that I struggle with, you know, because I, I came from a 20-year military career, and so I, I'd worked for, you know, one company for the majority of my adult life. And so I had this, this loyalty, which, you know, that's not a bad thing, but I would tell people that are, that are just getting into the ecosystem, don't approach the private sector, public sector, non-military job with, with the same mentality um because really you have to take care of your professional development and so like case in point and i've told this story before but when i um left the military my first company was pole source which is a phenomenal company um the, it's a consulting small boutique, boutique consulting firm uh, they gave me my shot you know in the ecosystem it treated me exceptionally well and, and i loved working for them and, and then salesforce came knocking on the door and, and i was originally going to tell salesforce no I'm, I'm not interested in interviewing and my girlfriend, now my wife, you know, um, asked me if I was crazy um, and, you know, reminded me that I need to take care of my professional journey. And, you know, yeah, loyalty is great. But but at some point, right to your point, Amanda, the next the next opportunity for growth comes up. You have to jump at it. And this this was that for me. Uh, and so I, so I took it. And then obviously that that extended and I worked at Salesforce for a bit. And, and then I got another role at Salesforce. And even though I love that team. I came over to solution engineering, which ended up being an even better fit. So again, to your point, just say yes. You never know what opportunities are going to present themselves. Um, and when they do present themselves, take advantage. Um, 
Sherilyn, you have a, a question. Oh, good to see you. Sorry, it's a bit you. late. Um, yeah, David, no I worries. love your point about having that innate feeling of loyalty. Um, that's definitely something that I have struggled with. And Amanda, my question is, do you have any tools or tips or tricks to help people step away from the emotional side and go more toward, okay, let me, let me think through this logically and take the emotions out of it when you're making those types of decisions. Ooh, speak about woo woo. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not, I, I know it's a good one. Um, uh, I always, I kind of go back to, um, I say, go back to center. Um, right. You got to go back to your own center. I go back to the vision, the why, the purpose. What the heck are you doing here? <laughs> do you know what it is? Uh, do you know why you're here? Uh, do you know what, you know, what your goal, your own personal goal or your own, perf, you know, uh, goal path is uh, the journey that you're looking to, to be on? Um, I, I think that's how I do it. Um, uh, and that's probably all I um, can offer there. Um, you know, people journal, people write it down, people have mentors, uh, sponsors, allies, um, talking to people outside of your business, outside of your group. Um, certainly, you know, you never want to discount your own family uh, or people that matter to you, your friends, right? Um, not everybody has to be in your immediate sphere that has, you know, the best piece of, you know, feedback or advice for you um, when it comes to, you know, your career path or decisions that you're stuck on or need to make. Um, but what I, I guess I would go back to the loyalty piece and say that, um, sad to say, but companies are only as loyal as they, as they are when they're meeting their targets, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I always remind myself of that is um, we are employees of us. If you are, in fact, an employee and not an entrepreneur uh, um, and running your own business, uh, you know, if you are an employee, you are, you know, governed by the fact that your company is making revenue and making its targets and making its goals. And um, so long as they're doing that, you know, uh, hopefully and you're performing really, really well, you're good. Um, but, you know, I always tell people like it's not personal because, you know, we're here to do an amazing job job and hopefully that's what we're doing and the company is thriving and doing the same but the moment they're not just like I said I've been laid off because they're not or they make a different decision on the path of their business uh, you know goals and that's fine that's not personal either um, but so you know and most people have what they say three three different careers if they will um, during the course of their life um, you know and those can be considered pivots um, but I would also say that um, it doesn't necessarily mean an exit out of your own company either. I think sometimes what I've witnessed is uh, people don't do enough diligence about the other opportunities within their own sphere. Uh, and so lateral moves are completely OK and they can change the trajectory of your life. Um, that is for sure. I've put, you know, when people come for coaching, you know, that have been working for me in the past, sometimes I recognize that they're not in the right role, but this role over here would be way more amazing for them, something they've never considered. Right. And so I think this is why mentorship or allyship or sponsorship, if you will, is so critical, um, external and internal to companies is, the, is because you need to be exposed sometimes to things you just don't even have a clue on. You know, are you an engineer? Engineer and what you really need to be doing is working on product um, or, you know, you're in marketing, you really need to be in sales. Uh, you don't know that sometimes, you know, it takes that, um, that, that village, that tribe, if you will, to, to remind you or, you know, open, open your eyes to some of that. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And, and Pearl, I see your hand. I just wanted to piggyback really quick on Amanda's comment. Um, because I, I totally agree with, with the mentorship aspect, and, and we've talked about mentorship on, on these calls before. It's hard to be objective um, when you're leaving a company that you love. Uh, and, and you obviously, you know, you, you want to leave in a good light if, if you even decide to leave at all. But, you know, you have to separate the emotions from, from the business. And the best way to do that is with a mentor. And so, and, and not just one mentor either. You know, if you're doing it correctly, you should be cultivating multiple different mentors across different industries that you can go to when you have these critical questions. And in my case, like my girlfriend wife now was one of my mentors. Um, she's a CIO for a pharmaceutical company. And I was like, hey, hon, what do I do? Like, both are great companies. I'm, I'm emotionally invested. They've treated me really well, but, but a Salesforce, you know, and 
Um, and she was not emotionally invested, <laughs> which is, is what is what helped. Um, she's like, no, yeah, you need to leave and go to Salesforce. That's what you've always said you wanted to do. Um, and so do that. And, and that's ultimately what, you know, what I decided to do. So, you know, have, have multiple mentors, get different perspectives and backgrounds, and that will help you be objective and separate the emotional, um, you know, from the logical and, and make good decisions. Yeah, I wouldn't be where I am uh, on pretty much any facet of my life, including my personal life, if I didn't have uh, multiple mentors. So, um, you know, we can certainly dig in there uh, if you want to, if there's questions about that. Um, but I but I highly recommend. Yeah, and that's what this this uh, whole forum is supposed to be, is a collaborative mentorship forum. So, you know, if you guys have, um, you know, issues that you're struggling with or questions, bring them up during these type of sessions, either in front of the group or grab one or two of the members that you've connected with and, and have those discussions offline. Um, but that's, that's what this is supposed to be for. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and we'll grab Pearl's question and then we're going to uh, take a quick break to grab a, a, a shot of the group that we can share on social media uh, so that we can um, flex our unique position of values um, by, by personally branding using social media. So Pearl, the floor is yours. Did you have a question or comment? Thank you. So back to mentorship, right? Um, so I do have, a few mentors and but the problem is sometimes they give me the advice are opposite to each other and that got me very confused because I'm very new to Salesforce still right um so I cannot I can I, you, I know only what I know I know I want to be a consultant I have two very good consultant mentors but they will tell me two different things. So I don't know what to do. That's one question. Second question is, I look way younger than my age, right? Um, and I'm going, I'm, I'm basically transition like many other people. Um, so I'm looking for entry level position, gain experiences. However, um, I also have my experiences. And sometimes when I'm not careful in certain interview, they are looking for very young people fresh from college. Um, so I would, I feel I got rejected because I actually probably give them too much about my past work experience and that's how I got shut down. So that's the, the I would like to know um, how do I play out without telling, one, without telling people my age, but I also would like to incorporate my work experience without showing too much that it would suit me down that I would not get the entry level Salesforce position. Okay, uh, thanks Pearl. Wow, those are pretty deep questions. Uh, a couple of things come to mind and just like your mentor, advice is advice is advice. You take the pieces that work for you and throw the rest away. Um, this 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 is true of anything in your life, right? Uh, in, including the advice your parents give you, right, or your spouse gives you. Um, so you know, on the first one on the mentorship, um, my gut tells me you need a mentor that maybe is outside of consulting. Uh, you know, that offers that you know three sixty uh, you know uh, view perspective. Um, you know. Uh, Everybody comes at things a different way. Uh, that's the way I look at it. So, you know, if you're feeling conflicted, maybe those aren't the two mentors for you on this. Maybe you just need to keep going to other people. Or conversely, the other thing that came up is, uh, is back to the getting centered thing. <laughs> what do you want to do, right? Because um, you can only take so many pieces of advice before you have to just sit and say, what, what do I know what I want, right? Now, how to apply that is a different story, right? Because you've never been there. So um, that's probably all I can say really say about that is maybe you need a perspective that that's not about consulting. Maybe it's more about transferable skills and less about the consulting aspect. Um, so that's the way that I, that I probably would approach that. Um, and the second um, element, uh, my gut is telling me, um, based on the information you gave me, that you're probably uh, interviewing down um, uh, so, um, what I mean by that is if you have transferable skills and you're applying into a new industry, 
you might not want to be going for the bottom of the rung internship, uh, you know, job um, because you're bringing a lot of skill set with you. Right. Maybe it's not that technical piece that you need, but maybe it's all this other stuff. And so I sometimes I don't think it's about age. Uh, I think it's about a person or a hiring manager looking at someone's resume and saying, wow, you're way too qualified for this role. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay you correctly. I'm not going to be able to teach you very much, um, you know, and you're going to leave in a year. I mean, that's the mentality when they're looking at your resume that probably has little to do with age. Um, so I'm not sure if that resonates with you, but I'm get, I get curious about if you're, pl- if you're applying for the right level of positions. Uh, what you said, it happened to me before. <laughs> it did. It did. Um, um, I was asked, what do I see myself in two years? So I said, well, I would like to be a manager. And the person said, well, you already talk like a manager. <laughs> I mean, that's- <laughs> so I, I did not. I did not get the position. Um, that that's the. But with Salesforce, why I would go with? I even take the. I took the non-paid internship before, because Salesforce is, is still technical, right? And I still need implementation um, skills. So I I I would jump on something that I feel. Um, Usually, my 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 choice of work usually is not immediate. How much I get, what I would try to see if I get out in one year or two year, how much how much I would grow from that one or two two years experiences. And in my experience, usually it worked that way because I would have like twenty five to fifty percent jump salary because I make that choice. I chose to have. A very difficult position, a work very hard. It's like a boot camp, but I learned a lot in the process. So I apply the same thing in Salesforce because honestly, it doesn't matter how many trial hat badges I have. I really don't have a lot of implementation experiences. That's the fact. So I cannot just say, yeah, I'm very confident about myself. Give me a six figures job. I, I can't do that. I, I, I really know I cannot do that. So that is the dilemma I feel. Um, how do I stay humble but bring in my experiences to to really get to have this one to two years experience under my belt? Then I can fly from there. You know. Yeah, and so um, you know, I I don't think we're gonna solve it on the call. Um, you know, but I think you know I did read someone's comment that says spin your age as a as a benefit, uh, and I agree with that. Um, I remember going to an interview at Adobe uh, and my resume was like really strong and I walked in and, um, you know, I don't remember it was the CIO or somebody I was interviewing with at the time. She's like, oh, my God, you're so young. Uh, Right. And and so this happens, right? Just ageism and people looking at you and judging you by your your gender, your age. You're too old. You're too young. I mean, you're not too anything. Right. So it's all a story. You got to tell a story. And the other thing that comes to mind is you might not be gaining all your experience in the job that you're going to. Can you go, you know, um, get implementation experience in a nonprofit so that you can put it on your resume? Can you go, uh, you know, volunteer somewhere so that you can get it on your resume? Um, You know, again, I go back to I, I feel like maybe you're underselling certain things because you don't have exactly that skill. And it might be just a a coaching mentoring thing around how you're selling yourself or how to tell that story effectively. Yeah, I would. Um, these are all great points and this is a fantastic discussion. Um, I want to piggyback really quick before we jump to the group photo, just to say a couple things. Um, so I agree with everything Amanda said, um, Pearl, from a mentorship, your first question perspective, if, if you're getting conflicting guidance from, from your, your different one of mentors, you might consider trying um, a group forum. So obviously, this is a group forum. Uh, you know, maybe the, maybe the next call you can bring up your consulting uh, question, and we can tackle that as a group. Other options, obviously, there's there's chatter groups in the Trailblazer community that you can join that are that are professional development focused that you can pose a question in. Salesforce Saturday is a phenomenal uh, forum for these types of conversations where you can say, "Hey guys, you know, I here's my dilemma. What would you do?" And you get all those different perspectives, um, and then then you can make your choice. So I, I'd offer that for the mentoring. For the implementation, you know, dilemma, you're absolutely right. 
that's one of the hardest things to, to overcome in this ecosystem is, is that work experience piece. And so I can only tell you how I did it um, because I came in obviously from the military. I had no previous experience, didn't know how to spell Salesforce. Uh, I, I did exactly what Amanda, you know, uh, recommended. I focused on my unique position of value or my brand. And when I had a, a decent brand and a decent network, I leveraged that network to get volunteer positions. Uh, and so Maravis, as many folks are on the call are, are, are aware of, and, and some some folks like Elio volunteer with Maravis. I, I was a consultant for them for a period of months uh, to get that experience. I was a consult. I was an admin for another veteran-focused nonprofit. Same time, building that experience as quickly as I could. And then, as you're aware, Pearl, you can get your own free dev org, and you can just build apps. I, I can't tell you the number of times that I have pulled out apps that I've built in my free time on weekends during a job interview and said, "Hey, here's what I've built." You know, not only do I, you know, do I have a little bit of experience with being an admin and so on, I use the product. I use it every day to manage my fitness, to manage my finances. And, and they got the hugest, the biggest kick out of that. So um, I, I would offer those uh, those tips, but more than happy to continue uh, talking about, you know, this in future sessions. Because like, like Amanda said, I don't think we're going to solve it today, but but it's a great question. And, and um, this is definitely the forum for it. Um, you know, Amanda, we, we've talked a lot about all the different transitions that you've gone through. And um, I guess my next question is, given the benefit of hindsight, what are some things that you would do differently if you could uh, to maybe help some of us avoid, you know, some um, some stumbles or, or some, some hazards that, that you've navigated throughout your career? Um, yes. So I think I've talked about a few of them, uh, you know, uh, um, first and foremost, I would say your health, your mental health, your well-being, your family, these things matter. Uh, when I was younger, a lot younger, I was way too focused on my career and the, and the ladder that I thought I wanted without really, you know, getting centered on my why and my purpose. And I probably discounted a lot of my own health and my wellness, but you know, as you get older, this doesn't uh, this doesn't fly. <laughs> this doesn't fly because stuff starts falling apart and falling off, and you know all that. So here we are. So your your health, uh, you know, taking care of yourself um, so that you can lead in your career, you can be a powerful person, you can influence others, you can perform your mission and your values. Um, this matters. I would say I already touched on it, but knowing your own values, uh, you know, I, you know, what are the top three to four things that you lead by every day that you want to see in your network and you, in your job uh, and in your life? This matters. Standing up for what you believe in and making sure, you know, like for me, characters and ethics and values are just high up there. So making sure that, you know, you're doing the right thing uh, at the right time with the right people. Um, this, this, I think, matters uh, to me. Um, and then, of course, not everything is about your damn career. Um, you know, so you got to have some fun in your life, you know, um, so not, you know, even in your own job, you can still have fun and you can still have a great you know, camaraderie with people that has really nothing to do with what you do on a daily basis. So bringing a little fun in your life, I would say um, that's a that's my own lesson, um, you know, learned. Those are, those are a little bit woo woo, but I can go into some more practical, um, you know, things that I was thinking about when it comes to sure. like practical application and practical advice. So I have a few of those. Um, one I already mentioned, which is, uh, you know, tag your it. You're the CEO of your own life. Uh, so you have nobody to blame, nobody to point the finger at when things aren't going right, when you're not getting what you want, when you don't have the salary you need, when you don't have the job you need, when your network is failing, when you're getting laid off and you don't have anybody to call, uh, you know, on and on the list goes. That's that's really you know, on you, it's on me, um, right? And so what are you doing every single day to make sure that those things are just solid and like the holes are filled, if you will. Um, and then I would say when you're in a company, and uh, there's a couple things that I would say are critical. Um, one is to know that how you personally are tied to the vision of the company. Um, I can tell you how many people cannot tell me that from my own teams or from other teams. They don't know how what they do in the company matters um, to the vision or, you know, the story of the company. And so, you know, this this is important. Why do you why is what you're doing? Um, how does that affect, you know, and attach to the vision or the mission of that particular company? That's important. 
Um, and then secondarily to that, knowing how you personally align to the revenue of that company, because at the end of the day, every company is a company to make money. The bottom line, <laughs> bottom line. So you are there to, you know, help do something to make money for that company. Uh, it sounds kind of harsh, uh, but it is in fact the truth. And uh, so how do you personally align to the revenue, no matter what your job is, no matter what your title is? Um, do you know what your group's, you know, numbers are, targets are? Do you know what your company's targets are, what you're trying to do and how you how you play into this? Um, another one I would say is um, solve cool problems, uh, right? Be the one that solves the cool problems. Um, that not only is that exciting, uh, right? Um, you know, um, it, you know, you're a solutions provider. You're taking care of something. You're solving cool problems. This um, you know, gives you more value in your role and in your company. Um, and then the next uh, thing that I always heard is change roles every two years. This doesn't mean change companies. This doesn't mean just jump around. This means change roles, meaning you're growing, you're developing, you're taking lateral moves, upwards moves, sideways moves, whatever those moves are, you're developing yourself and uh, make a move every two years. So got to put on your calendar, like work towards that, you know, thing. Um, you know, if that's the type of um, person you are, I think you can chip away at that on a daily, weekly basis, right? Um, every two years. And if so, if you're the CEO of your own career, like it's on my calendar in two years, I know exactly what I want to be doing. And again, it might not be in your current company. Uh, it might be in your current company and you're staying still in that, but over here in these nonprofits, man, you want to rock and roll. You want to be on a board. You want to be uh, you know, serving in a different capacity. So again, not everything is in your particular lane in your role or in your company, but it could be all those aspects because you're three, 360 degrees, right? Um, from nonprofits to service, to your you know career, to your you know family and how all this sort of fits together. Those are great nuggets. Thanks, Amanda. I wanted to, um, to kind of circle back to something you said about, you know, primarily or at its core, every every company has to make money. And so you have to very quickly show your value. Um, what are some things in, in the final kind of minutes that we have here? What are some things that you've done through all of your different pivots to show your value, say, in the first 90 days? Because a lot of the a lot of the folks that come to this call are either just starting or maybe they're they're taking an internship program through hiring our heroes and they are in their first 90 days. Um, and just trying to make sure that they show that value so that at the end of that internship period, that 12 week period, they can be retained um, and you know, launch a successful career in the ecosystem. I'll tell you what the number one thing that comes to mind is, um, and this is gonna sound probably so simple, um, but it's so true. Um, do you know what your boss's goals are and how to make their job easier? Like, that's kind of it, <laughs> right? You're there working for a person and can you make their job easier by doing something, right? And what is that something? I don't know, because everybody on here is coming from a different um, lens, perspective, you know, industry and so forth. Um, but, you know, somebody who comes in in the first 30, 60, 90 days and asks me the question, Amanda, what are your goals? How am I going to make you successful? That's the person that I'm going to spend the most time on, to be frank, as a leader, right? That's that's the first thing is you want time and attention, uh, you know, from your leadership. Um, the second thing is um, what I like to say is 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 learner's mind. Uh, we don't know everything and we have to be um, humble in that we don't know everything. And so what are we here to learn? Um, right. And so in 30, I can say this because I'm new to my role in the last three months. And the first thing I did was not come in and make a bunch of changes in my group. First thing I want to do is find out what my group is doing really, really well. Uh, and so I think, you know, in the first 30, 60, 90, it should be about interviewing the people around you to figure figuring out what is going well here. What's not going so well? And then what's not going so well? That's where I look at that and say, well, there's projects here. There's value here. There's cool stuff to solve here, right? Over here in this. But there's also stuff going really, really well. And how do I contribute to that? So those are a few things that, co that come to mind. That's really helpful. It, so one of the things, because it reminds me of actually some of the guidance that I got when I was serving is um, one of the things that my boss would always tell me is that, you know, <laughs> 
you know, his, his boss's um, goals, you know, should be interesting, but his boss's boss's goals should be fascinating. So he was always thinking two levels up and trying to, you know, not only satisfy his boss's goals, but his boss's boss's goals to be forward looking um, and to get that, um, you know, that recognition up the, up the, cha the chain of command. Uh, and, and I find that, that that's that's been helpful for me, um, you know, starting out in the ecosystem is, is to meet with all of, of my bosses and, and to really, to your point, know what their goals are, but several levels up so that when I start knocking those out, like they take notice and um, it just, I, I've noticed that it, it helps me with, with my brand, but also with my, my career progression and recognition. So that's a great point. Yeah. We've got... Um, Time for one more question, and Kathleen had a question in chat, and she'd like to know, uh, Amanda, uh, what books or podcasts uh, do you like for career growth? Um, wow. Um, remember when I said this idea that you can't be all things to all people? The same thing exists when it comes to time. Just time, man, time's a commodity. I don't have time for it right now. Um, so I'd be remiss to tell you I'm reading any books or I'm listening to like, you know, I'm not, that's not where I'm at right now. Um, I think the last, uh, book that I read or listened to, um, uh, is it the, excuse my language, but the Buddha and the badass, um, that was pretty interesting, uh, leadership book, um, and a pretty cool journey, um, from a leader. So, uh, you know, I'd recommend it just because I really liked it and it was most recent, um, but I'd have to maybe I'll uh, scrape my mind, uh, you know, later tonight or this weekend and post some stuff in the in the LinkedIn because nothing nothing comes to mind. Um, I'm honestly I'm more apt to have a verbal conversation with a mentor um, than I am to read a book uh, to learn something. So I'm just more of an experiential, you know, um, uh, pull it from all sources kind of person. Uh, and when I don't have time, I lean towards trying to meet with people one on one, um, um, it, you know, or in groups, which just hasn't happened um, very much in the last couple of years. Um, but it used to be really uh, also an effective um, thing for me. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I, I can definitely relate to, to not reading as much as I, I think I probably should, because all of my reading lately has been technical reading and and. We, we have a learning platform called Trailhead, and so I spend most of my time there reading. Uh, yeah. Right reading now, I'm, I'm busy learning about genomics and uh, optical genome mapping, and um, you know, trying to uh, you, you know get smart because everybody I'm on the phone with around my team are uh, just uh, you know they run circles around me um, in in their knowledge, which is amazing. So I'm like learning. I'm doing all this learning in my in my role right now, and sometimes that's okay. Uh, you don't need to be reading or, you know, growing in another regard if you're also growing at work, because how much, how many brain cells do I have to apply uh, to this <laughs> every single day? But um, I love the question. So thank you. Yeah. But but Kathleen, to, I mean, to your, to your question and to your point, like obviously reading is, is huge uh, for kind of opening you up to different mindsets and, and different problem solving um, methodologies. And so even though I don't, admittedly ashamedly read much right now there were years where i, I read um 50 to 60 books and it was a goal to read a book a week and and um so i would get up every morning and i would read for three or four hours and so behind me i, I do have some great books i just i don't want to go searching through while you guys are on the on the call so at the next session I'll, I'll have a stack here and if you happen to be able to attend uh more than happy to share some books that were influential for me i i, I tend to like to read two books at the same time that are that are different um different focus because then you know as, as you're reading both of those it causes you to think in, in ways you normally wouldn't think and and those ideas kind of meld together so you, you reach some really interesting conclusions and, and i've had like epiphanies um that i never would have had had i not taken two completely different books and put them together and read them not at the same time but like you know read one one night read, read the next the other night so just a technique but more than happy to share those um we are a little bit over time um so we'll hey, go ahead and yeah I know we're over time, but I want to add, you know, two sure. really practical pieces of advice that I try to tell everybody because um, they're kind of pet peeves of mine. And because I've been in the industries a long time and I hire a ton of people, um, you know, I just really feel like um, I, if I don't pass them on, um, you know, that's not good. So uh, first things first, if you're on LinkedIn and you're networking with people, please do not ask them for anything until you are already providing value to them. 
Uh, I don't know if you've heard this before, but add value way before asking for anything from anyone on LinkedIn or from your network, right? Um, so if I get a random reach out from someone I haven't heard from for two years and they want a reference from somebody, nope. Uh, so sorry. Um, right. Um, but, you know, the things that I love is when somebody randomly sends me an article because they thought of me and they know that I care about X, Y and Z. And so it spawns, you know, it's kind of spawns this dialogue and this discussion. How are you? How's your career? Do you need anything? Um, right. So adding value before, you know, um, way before you ask for something. That's the first thing online. And the second thing is if you're interviewing, um, with anybody internally, externally, wherever you're interviewing, um, please research who you're interviewing with. Uh, how many times do I interview people who have no idea who I am, uh, what I'm about, or have thoughtful questions for me? Uh, you know, we have this fantastic thing called Google. Um, absolutely cyber stock the heck out of the people that you're that you're interviewing with, including in your own company. You should be interviewing their friends all the way around their network. You should be reading the articles that they've written. You should know pretty much everything about them because this um, people hire people who are relatable. It's not just about your experience. It's do you relate to me? I can tell you the number of jobs or positions I've gotten or promotions I've gotten because I can relate to a person and what they're doing with their story, with their article, with their network, with a friend of theirs who happens to know X, Y, and Z. And so these little pieces that build your portfolio and your network are so critical. So please, please, please um, research um, the heck out of the people that you're interviewing with. That's awesome. Those are great points to end on. Thank you, Amanda. And, and before we do close, I just want to thank you again for, for spending time here talking to us about your, your career pivots um, and all the different transition tips, tools, best practices that you shared over the course of the hour. Really appreciate it. Uh, and it's, it's been uh, helpful for me. And I know it's been helpful for, some, for, for the folks on the call as well. So thank you. Great. You're so welcome. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. And thank you, everyone, for, for spending time here uh, on your Wednesday evening to uh, dedicate it toward learning. Um, we will be taking the next couple of weeks off. So uh, join us again on January 5th, where we'll be uh, launching into the series again. And I've got folks lined up all the way through June, uh, all different career paths, all different skill sets. So a lot of great content. In the meantime, have a great rest of your Wednesday evening. Have a safe and happy holidays. And we'll see you back real soon. Thanks, everybody.